a chase along the edge of a 152 meter deep canyon. The hunt for a dangerous ex-con. Lift off them, clear hands. Get on the ground now. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. And a mission to find the supernatural creature locals call the Howler. To hear it, it sends chills down the spine. 70,000 square kilometers of the Wild West. Spread out across three states. This is the largest Indian reservation in North America. And these are the Navajo cops. Navajo cops Filbert Toddy and Genevieve Morgan close in on the suspect in an attempted murder. This is Navajo police. You need to come outside and meet us. You understand? Navajo police, if you're inside, come outside. The case began three hours earlier, as Toddy was about to finish his shift. The former Marine and no-nonsense police officer time. responded to a call of shots fired at a remote ranch. Okay. Um, I was hurting sheep today and I heard a gunshot, so I thought that. There is a disagreement between the two parties over land and livestock. According to the lady here, the individuals right down the way shot her. In a region where many families still rely on livestock, land disputes like this one are common. There is no private property on the reservation. We only have tribal leases. The dispute is because certain families are saying, this is my land and you're on my land. And they can get to a point where um, people are going to start running around shooting at the other family. Who they were, you know, I got the description of the people. The victim is able to identify two of the three men that were allegedly involved in the attack. It's not the first one. They were dressed both black, black okay. pants and then black jacket and they're carrying a big duffel bag to the door. Their names are Joshua and Donovan. They were both black. Joshua and uh -huh. did you see any firearms with him? I didn't want to really look at them, mm -hmm. but my nephew said that he was carrying a big rifle with a big barrel. Okay. Our first suspect is Joshua. I dealt with him before and I actually been called up to his place several times. So right now what we're trying to figure out is how we're gonna take him down. We have sufficient enough evidence right now to proceed on with a high risk situation. Since the suspect is potentially armed and dangerous, Toddy isn't taking any chances as he heads to Joshua's house. Based on the information that we received from the victim, it's going to be a attempted murder type of case right now, so we're going to use any means necessary to get him into custody. This is Nava Police. You need to come outside and meet us. You understand? Nava Police, you're inside, come outside. So he's not coming out right now, so what we're going to do is we're going to move in. Officer Morgan will be taking the front. I'll be covering the back. It's taking way too long. You know, something may have happened to Morgan. Turns out that she's cuffing the suspect. Hello. You the mother? Yeah. I'm Officer Tyler with Monarch PD. Um, the reason why we're here is because it's a serious incident that occurred here. Okay, we got numerous reports that your son was shooting at another human being. Yeah. Okay, is there any firearms in this house? No. While Toddy questions the man's mother, Joshua tells Officer Morgan where to find the second suspect, Donovan. Okay. Well, we'll go over there right now. Drive. Yeah, we got Joshua detained. We're ATL for the other subject, Donovan. Doors open. Inside, 
a potential shooter can see their every move. It's a perfect scenario for an ambush. Police officers, to your head. Get your hands, turn around. Turn around. Keep your hands on top of your head. Watch, watch your left. You here by yourself? Okay, take the child back inside, please, while you're standing there, go. Does that have to? Yes. Why? Child doesn't need to be experienced. Are you going to use a gun? No, go back inside. That's enough. Quit being childish. The reason why we're here, okay, because we got numerous reports from one of the family right down the way here, Donovan and Joshua, were apparently discharging firearms right up the well here. They were physically identified, okay, by certain family members. They saw physically who they were, what they were dressed like, and they identified the firearm and who was firing them. So that's why we're up here with our guns and everything like this, OK? Because we're not going to take any nonsense like this. It's just for our own personal safety. Because we're trying to locate that weapon. Come on down, Joshua. Yeah. How old are you? 19. 19? OK, you pretty much know what's going on. Oh, OK. The reason why we're here is because you've been reported to have been shooting at someone up in the, up in the hill over, over here. I've been reporting yes. to you somebody. And I'm gonna be straight up with you. I wasn't. I was hanging out with him today. Who? At Donovan. Uh -huh. And he did tell me who he, him and his, um, my cousin shot at somebody. And I know who my. Uh, if you want, I can tell you who which one of my cousins it was. Do. It's uh, his name is Marcus. Donovan, sit up. Who's Marcus? Uh, he's my cousin. Was he with you all day? Uh, yeah. Okay, it's pretty much, it's all there, but you're tied in, regardless, you, you deny it or not. My main concern right now is where is that firearm? Uh, I'm pretty sure he has it. Who? Marcus. Marcus? Yeah. He has a shotgun. Uh-huh. If he did not go to his house, then he's back in Phoenix. Because he had to go to school. Joshua tells Toddy that Marcus is planning on leaving the reservation to start college in Phoenix. If this individual does leave the reservation, you know, the weapon can vanish with him as well. So we need to track him down and take that weapon as evidence. Uh, can you look up a Marcus? <laughs> Officer Morgan right now is taking our two suspects into jail in Windrock. So right now, I'm going to be handling the situation alone and be dealing with this shooter by myself. And we don't have much time. 160 kilometers east. Strange reports have been coming from the eastern edge of the reservation. In the town of Crown Point, New Mexico, a team of Navajo cops has gathered to launch an investigation into a mysterious creature known as the Howler. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have Operation Second Chance, investigate the strange noises the community been reporting. We don't know what it is. Uh, so we'll investigate it tonight, try to find out what it is. Calls involving the supernatural are common on the Navajo Nation, and it's police policy to investigate them anytime the public is concerned. Bobby Arviso is a hunter who has lived on the reservation all his life. I heard it myself. It's more like a woman crying song. Some saying that Bigfoot's in the area, some hunt the hunters, they're saying it, they think it's an elk sound, but it's not an elk call. I'm a hunter myself, so I can distinguish between the two sounds there. Here among the Navajos, majority of the people would say that uh, it would be more like a skinwalker. In Navajo tradition, a skinwalker is a shapeshifter. Like a werewolf, it's a person who completely transforms into a wolf or a coyote. They are witches that can bring sickness and even death to their victims. It has a lot to do with witchcraft. Skinwalkers, they re dig up the dead, use their bones and use whatever they can use off of a corpse. When I first heard this, it just went straight, like it went, ooh, for a long time. But the second sound, it sounds like a female cry. 
Tonight, Captain Steve Nelson is sending a team of Navajo police officers into the hills south of town to see if they can find it. We're just getting too many texts, too many reports, people calling us. We just want to verify, see what it is. So if we do see something, we're just going to try to find out what it is, and then after that, we'll make the necessary contacts on how to deal with it. But if you are threatened, protect yourself. The officers have searched the internet for a sound similar to what the locals have been reporting. If nothing happens between 2 and 2.30, uh, I'm going to play this sound. The closest match, the scream of an alleged Bigfoot. That sound right there on the external PA to see if we can get a response. Now, with local tensions at an all-time high, the Navajo cops are sending a team of officers out into the hills to investigate the mysterious noises and locate the howler. There are some right there. We're moving into our positioning now. We'll be going off road up here. And when they get to position, they'll be calling in. Then we're going to shut down and go stealth. Let's see if we can find out what's causing all of this commotion over here. On the hunt for the mysterious howler, the Navajo cops are going in heavily armed. Officer Custer Bryant has even brought along his sniper rifle. We're at the edge right now. Right here is a cliff, about a 20, 30 feet drop. Down here in the valley, this is where the, most of the concentration and screaming has been coming from. That's a dog right now. The team uses night vision glasses and infrared video cameras. Custer Bryant thinks he's spotted something. There's somebody is laying right there or something right there. Bryant's night vision can track a creature using its body heat. Something is lying in the valley below. How far up? Mm, probably about 50 yards up. Closer inspection reveals nothing more than a stray dog. Dog. At 2.30 AM, Lieutenant Begay plays the recording of the alleged Bigfoot through his PA system. He hopes to inspire a response from the howler. on the sound. Just listen up to see if you hear anything. But all they hear is silence. The team decides to pack it in for now. In a few weeks, they will return to this area to hunt for the howler once again. You hear it? It sends chills down the spine of a lot of people. And the way I hear from my neighbors and from my wife, they don't want to hear it again. 160 kilometers west, Officer Filbert Toddy is on the trail of the third suspect, named Marcus, involved in an attempted murder near Sanders, Arizona. Right now, uh, we'll be heading over to another location with another individual that we'll be questioning or making contact with. So, these label as the primary individual with the firearm. Toddy doesn't have an address, just a description of the house. 
Gonna look for a blue house with a white Tahoe. Oh, here we go. 44, no, be at the location. Hello. Okay, um, the, the reason why I'm here. Toddy finds the primary suspect asleep inside the house. Marcus, your name is being brought up in an investigation I'm doing right now, in which you are reported to be shooting around with Donovan. It's very important that That's you tell me, tell me the location of that firearm. Why you need it? Yes. Where is that? Is that Donovan's house? No. Joshua's house? No. Toddy takes Marcus into custody and searches the house. I located several boxes of ammunition, shotgun and slug rounds. He's going to give me information of where we can locate this firearm. I want to have your mother get your shoes, pants, and a shirt. And All three suspects are now in custody. But in order to make his case stick, Toddy still needs the shotgun. This one? Is that a blue house with a red truck? Why don't you tell me, buddy? You're the yeah. one directing me. There's a red truck. It's a red car. Is your me. You're going to have a different story coming up right now. Do you want to with you? I know what's up. Hello. How you doing, Yate? The reason why I'm here, OK, because I have Marcus in the vehicle here. And he says his firearm is in that red Dodge truck. The people inside tell Toddy that Marcus's aunt has driven the truck and the shotgun to a casino in Gallup, New Mexico, 72 kilometers away. The boys here said that she's unaware that that weapon's inside the vehicle. So, so we can track that, that vehicle down and get the weapon out. The suspect is clearly feeling the heat. Marcus isn't feeling too good right now. I guess he just realized you now the amount of crap that he got himself involved in with this assault. Now because you know his aunt's out there driving around with this weapon in her vehicle. Guilt? They said that she might be on her way to casino. Now the problem that we have now is that her auntie is driving a vehicle with a weapon in there that she doesn't know about. Finally, Toddy is able to make contact with Marcus's aunt. Hello? Is this Marlene? Where are you at, Marlene? This is Officer Toddy with One Rock Police Department. Can you do me a real quick favor? Okay, thank you. The woman agrees to meet Officer Toddy at a truck stop on the outskirts of Gallup. I'm turning Marcus over to Officer Morgan. I'll meet you up at the station. Okay. Then I'm going to proceed on to Gallup to retrieve the shotgun. It's nearly 4.30 a.m. when Toddy rolls into the truck stop. 15 hours have passed since the shooting took place. Hello. I'm the officer that you spoke with, Officer Toddy. Let's talk over here. It is cold. Um, just basically what's going on is that you know, your nephew, yeah. Marcus, okay, apparently I guess him and another individual were walking around the open field and discharging the firearm at a lady. They almost made contact with her above, you know, on her head. So I missed her. Oh my God. I, um, I think this Yeah, that's, that's his duffel bag there. Okay, is that what he said? Yes. Thank you so much, okay? So no one is hurt, right? No, 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 just a little bit shooken up about what's going to happen. It's the same weapon described by the victim and the other two suspects. It also matches the 12 gauge slugs that I retrieved from the house. One weapon off the street, person responsible in custody, and good results tonight. You know, this individual will never see this weapon again. I felt tired, but gratified that I did my job. Justice has been served for this family. It's time to go home, do a lot of paperwork now. Yeah. The Navajo Police Drug and Gang Unit rolls into town for a roundup. We're here in Shiprock now, and uh, we're going to be serving over 20 warrants, our Navajo Nation tribal warrants, and also uh, state 
extradition warrants for uh, charges of uh, armed robbery to check frauds to uh, four degree felony DUIs. Mainly natives because uh, they're hiding here on the Navajo Nation and it's hard for the states to come in and actually make their arrests. Gilbert Yazi is an avid hunter and a former paramedic and firefighter who's been with the Navajo PD for 15 years. He joined the drug and gang unit over concerns about the rising crime among young Navajos in his community. How it's gonna go, we're broken down into four teams. Go Today, he and his unit have teamed with the New Mexico State Police and the U.S. Marshals. This is a part of interagency uh, joint efforts that we do. Our unit, the Naval Police Drug Enforcement, assists U.S. Marshals and state probations to execute these warrants. There's some pretty good warrants in here for some violent crimes, so hopefully we can uh, clean up the Navajo Nation communities and get these guys uh, off the Navajo Nation. Because the drug and gang officers mostly do undercover work, many of their identities must remain a secret. Their first target today, an armed robbery suspect. There's that house that they just built here. I sat on the house the other day. Um, he's there. We'll go ahead and hit this one first. So just be careful. So make sure we get the house surrounded. Just watch your backs. Several officers are inside the house. They just took in the warrant, so I don't know who, who they're talking to right now. There's someone in there, but it's not him. I don't know where he's at, but they did it once over, it's not him. They're not saying it's him, or they don't know where he's at. We ID that guy. It doesn't appear to be our suspect. Uh, needles are found in the house, vinegrin. Um, Stuff like that. Okay. Uh, anything on these structures here? Nothing that I, I know of yet. Yeah, we got an open window there. I don't know. Kind of no looks like not. a storage trailer more than anything. No one hooked this place up. Right. Those open windows, they don't seem right. Somebody could be watching us right now. It's like a hangout place here. This would be the place he'd be hiding. Like yeah. Foosball, everything in here. Police department. Yeah, yeah. Keep your hands where we can see them, man. Come on. Interesting. More of a hangout place. It's dark and pretty well fixed up in there for uh, a tavern atmosphere. Wondering what's not going on. Have a seat there, man. Do you have an ID on you? These two gentlemen are not the ones we're looking for. One is the brother, and the other is the friend. Do you have any idea? No, I don't. Is it OK if we check inside? Yeah. Nobody else in there? Nobody. All right. Why don't you guys go ahead and step up? We both said that they didn't know what was going on. Do you guys know these people over here in the brown house? Yeah, that's the brother of the individual gave us consent to search the residence. Oh, police. Let's pat you down real quick. Come over this way, man. We looked around inside and also gave a warrant check on both of them. Any weapons or anything like that we'll find inside? That's obvious. And uh, oh. one of them is actually wanted for a uh, vehicular homicide. Well, my dad, he got that from um, his work. As the officers search the trailer, huh? they make an important discovery. Residue of... Uh, methamphetamine, small one inch by one inch baggies. Legally, I, we can still test it, put it in a tester. If it comes back uh, to be methamphetamines, we can charge them for it. Then it did come back to be positive for methamphetamines. We're talking to him right now. He's not looking at jail time. He is a user, not a dealer. In this case, we're looking for uh, the brother. We put the scare tactics on him, and uh, you know it could go both ways. Either he doesn't cooperate, and we end up arresting him, 
for the charges of possession of methamphetamines. Or he can help us out and get his brother in jail where he needs to be. Yazi gets the cooperation he needs. The man says the fugitive is at a job fair. All right, we're going to head out east. In a small Navajo community called Upper Fruitland, the brother is warned not to tip off the suspect. You should let him know. Don't be making any phone calls to him because yeah, we'll put a tap on his phone or That's something. That's what I told him. I said, I said we're going to. I mean, if you, if, you, if you let your brother know, I mean, if we find out, I mean, we can pull up your phone records and see if you called him, the number you gave us, and then we can, we can do it that way. He's like, oh, okay, I want to He's so scary, he's not going to tell anybody. I hope so. All righty. Delta 10 280. We're going to go up to Upper Fruitland. Supposedly, that's where he's at, at the job fair. Going into a crowded place, job fair is usually hundreds of people. Being tactical stands out a lot. Delta 10 253. We are going to go in there and make that approach differently. It is very dangerous, especially with the warrant that he's on uh, for armed robbery and assaulting a police officer with the firearm. Hey, Michael. How's it going, man? Officer Yazi. OK, can we talk somewhere? It is hard for these young gentlemen that are seeking jobs out there. Can we use this office real quick? We have a warrant out for you. Maybe he wanted to get on with his life. In a way, a sense, when we talk to them, we've all helped them. Because if they're running on a warrant, they're going to be running for as long as they can. 10, 15 of them? It's just a matter of time that the warrant will catch up with them. And it did today. At the end of panned out, uh, got the major criminal off the road and off the streets and from the neighborhood. So uh, hopefully uh, he puts an end to his criminal history. The next day, Officer Christopher Holgate arrives at the Navajo Police Training Center. The Navajo are one of the few Native American tribes with their own academy. Before going out on duty, Holgate and many of the other Window Rock officers will have to re-qualify with their Glock handguns. Each officer will fire 50 rounds. Every bullet is worth five points. They need to score at least 200 points in order to pass the test. Jefferson, scoot back a little bit. One of Holgate's instructors today is senior officer Gilbert Yazzie with the Navajo Drug and Gang Unit. The officers have 50, 50 rounds, and they have to get all 50 rounds in this gray area for points. So each one that's out, we, um, we, there are five points each. It's difficult, especially from the 25 for some officers, but if they have their sight alignment and trigger control, they're pretty much gonna have all 50 rounds inside the gray area. So I've been doing this now 14 years, and uh, every year we have to do this twice a year, day and low light qualification. Of course, we don't always limit ourselves just to qualification. You know, we're often encouraged to come out and, and shoot. The more we do it, the better we are. Fire! The better confidence you know, that we have when we come out here and, and shoot. And when it's real in real time, you know, real life, in court or legally, we we can justify our our, our deadly force situations. Both Holgate and Officer Jefferson Lilly shoot a perfect score, 250 points. Yeah! Woo! 250. It's been a while since I hit 250. That's after about six tries. Yeah. <laughs> well, I did pretty good, 250. Uh, first attempt, I did 235. Um, but I'd say this is what training we come out here for, uh, to make sure everyone's up to date. Did pretty well. You know, surprised myself. And all the guys did standing uh, shooting. It's practice. It's all they need to do is practice, practice, practice. And practice makes perfect. Now that the daytime qualification is over, the officers will have to shoot in a low light scenario. Fire! Because most of them work at night, this training is critical.
160 kilometers away, Officer Christopher Holgate gears up for a night shift in the Window Rock District, the capital of the Navajo Nation. Go down little, yeah, it's the most populated area of a reservation that is mostly rugged and rural. Police officers, your hands. This is the uh, new shotgun that all officers in the Window Rock District have now. It's the uh, Mossberg 590. Most of the time, we've been going through shots fired calls with just our sidearm. But sometimes, you know, we go to some of these calls and we are outgunned. Holgate is a 28-year-old father of two and has been a Navajo cop for four years. Before I go on duty, I, you know, bless myself with this bitter herb, you know, to help me uh, be protected you know, in my traditional ways. And this bitter herb does protect me because when I'm going out there, you know, I'm dealing with a lot of people. And a lot of people would like to harm me in certain ways, you know, witchcraft, evil doings, evil ways. But once I put this on, I, I feel protected. All right, guys, I'm gonna head to work. Well, I have tattoos of my uh, kids, my daughter, Kiara, and my son, Trey, because they're always with me wherever I go. My mindset before I go on duty is I am gonna come home tonight. And I'm sure every officer feels the same way, that they want to come home safely at the end of their shift. I'll see you guys later. All right, now I'm working night shift, a graveyard, as we call it, shift three. I like the nights. It's a challenge at first, but you get used to it. There's a lot more action. It's probably one of the most dangerous shifts that you could be on. There should be a lot of action going on tonight. We have other units that are on right now uh, to help us because um, the Friday night is usually the biggest night. The downside of it could be a lot more uh, calls. It's already full we'll draft. A little after 10, Holgate is called out to the remote community of Sawmill, where a group of six men led by an ex-con with a long history of violence have started trouble with their neighbors. One of our known regulars, uh, they call him like every other day. Third call was received stating that he was at his uh, girlfriend's house. So me and another officer were heading up that way to go check it out. The guy's a known offender. He just like, he likes to take off when law enforcement's there. But uh, he's one of those guys you just gotta watch out for. Him. So he's down there. He's down, down here at the highway, yeah. All right, now they told us that the guy we're looking for is uh, with some other individuals that we know are known offenders also. Uh, we usually use caution around them. They like to take off. They, uh, last time we had to use that night vision to catch five of the guys that were hanging out with him. I believe that he was one of them. And I actually had to tase one of the guys. So I'm going to go check it out, see if we can catch him on foot. In these poorly lit rural areas outside of town, night vision goggles can be the difference between life and death for Navajo officers. She tells her we need another unit. 10 for is 3 3 available, and possibly six subjects if we have another unit with the night vision. Well, just recently, one of the guys that they're hanging out with, he had uh, drugs and uh, he had two handguns. So I'm just trying to wait here for another additional unit because there's six of them and two of us. Backup finally arrives. That's where they're coming from, their house. But the officers still don't have any infrared glasses. Yeah, it's a lot more dangerous because you don't know if they're hiding over here, crouched down somewhere. Like I said, the last time we used a night vision, we sat here and they actually came towards us, but they couldn't see us. And we were able to sneak up on them, and we actually caught five of them. But it's the same people that are disturbing here. A couple of them like to fight, and they resist. So we can cut those lights. Suddenly, Holgate hears the suspects in the darkness. Hey, what's up? Police officer, see your hands. See your hands. Get on the ground now. Get on the ground. Get on the ground now. Get on the ground. Now! Put your hands behind your back, man. Okay. 
What's your name, man? Joshua Tushi. Tushi, why are you disturbing again, man? The officers arrest two of the suspects. But they're still looking for four more men, including a dangerous ex-con. 3320. Luckily, Officer Jefferson Lilly arrives with the much needed night vision goggles. The officers believe that the men they're looking for may be hiding with friends in a nearby house. You can't see anything those trees. Get down, get down, get down, get down, all the way down your stomach. All in your stomach, man. You two, get on your knees. Get on your knees, get on your stomach. Don't move, man. Put your arms out, put your arms out, arms out. I just wonder what the dogs were barking about. Where's um, <laughs> Preston? Oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. no, I'm all right. I just barely woke up. You barely woke up? Mm -hmm. You got anything in you? Who else is in there? This residence here is known for uh, criminal activity. Uh, Officer Lily seen the two, male and female, standing outside the residence. So we detained them for now. You don't mind if we check down, sir? Yeah, go ahead. There ain't nothing in there. As Holgate questions the man, Lily makes a frightening discovery. I heard something drop. What did you drop back there? Oh, that's that was it. You dropped those ones? Yeah, because I don't like I don't even know who was out here. You know you're not supposed to have weapons, right? Mm, I don't know about that. No? Yeah, it was just for protection, you know. I don't know who's out here. 34 when I handmade something. It's just straight out. Sticky. Like a shank. You can pretty much go through the both of it. He even threw those weapons down, man. You can't have no weapons or whatnot, man. You got to be inside. I dealt with him before in the past, and it turns out that he was on probation that he was not supposed to carry any type of weapon, including nines. Back on that side, no? The main person we were looking for isn't here, but he gave his consent to go ahead and go inside his residence and check on the other guys. No, please. So once we made entry, we, you know, had our weapons. The person that's been here before actually had some weapons on him, a couple of handguns. So we just detain people for now. Lay there. Don't move for me, man. Okay. Don't Again, where do you see him? No police. No police, open the door. Police officer. Get down, on the ground, on the ground. On the ground. On the ground dude. Don't move. Anybody else in here? Mm -hmm. no. Well, it turns out none of the people are involved in the disturbance that occurred tonight, but we're running warrants on all of them right now. The younger one that was here, he actually had a warrant for his arrest uh, for failure to appear for a court. Of the six men the cops were looking for tonight, four have gotten away. But Holgate still has some questions for the man with the knives. Yeah, the reason why I brought out those on knives is because skinwalkers have been trying to come up here too, so. Skinwalkers? Yeah. I don't know about that one, man. That's I don't know those knives would help. <laughs> I know, but. So you just said it was weapons that, you know, possibly you know, protect themselves from skinwalkers, but. You know, I don't know, different stories and whatnot. The main person we were looking for isn't here, so I just let him go. The next day, Officer Farrell Yazi is on patrol in the town of Chinle, Arizona. When he's called out to Canyon de Shea, sacred ground to the Navajo people. 
and a major draw for tourists. Here, non-natives get their first glimpse of Navajo culture. But right now, it's the scene of a brutal fight over native artwork. Got another call, three male individuals fighting. We'll go ahead and roll on that, see if we can assist the other officers here. Navajo officers quickly pick up two of the men, fleeing from the fight. Why are you breathing so hard, man? Oh, are you? Running from what or who? My other brother. A third suspect has disappeared and may be armed. Yeah, but when... Okay. And apparently the third suspect that we have might have gone down the trail here, so let's see if we can locate him. Probably went down the trail. Suddenly, the officers spot the suspect trying to climb the cliff. The whole area here, you know, we're basically on the edge of the canyon. If you look down here, there's about a four or 500 foot drop straight down. The officer's life was put in danger there. We never know what this guy is on, if he's intoxicated, you know, if he's on drugs, or his state of mind. He could have easily grabbed that officer, take him over the edge with him. Officer Farrell Yazi rushes in to assist with the arrest on the edge of a 152 meter deep canyon. Fighting? No. Nah. Put all the scratches on your arm, bud. Just run away from the puppets. Running? Yeah, if you didn't do anything, why are you running, then? Just running away from the puppets. How old are you? 19. 19? Search them. Nothing in your pocket? No needles or nothing? Right. So what happened? I made a dispute over money. Dispute over money? Right when I came, these guys started talking crap to me. I said, I lost my money, I lost my money. The dispute was between three brothers who make and sell Navajo rock art to tourists. Apparently, all three male individuals here have claimed to some of these this artwork here. And you know, there was a dispute over how much money was made. I was selling it to the tourists, me and my little brother were selling rock. That's you guys' stuff over there? Yeah, that's yeah. it. And I guess that's what the fight was about in an area where jobs are scarce. Looks busy up here today. Selling native artwork and jewelry is big business. The officers bag the brothers' artwork as evidence. Alabama. And then all three men are transported to the Chinle Jail. 112 kilometers away, officers in the Window Rock District are amping up their patrols along Route 264. State Highway 264 is also known as the Code Talkers Highway. It was named after the Code Talkers who fought in World War II in the Pacific using our native language, our Navajo language, as a code. But it also is the main lifeline that actually comes into Wind Rock, also throughout the reservation. But when we get a lot of calls, it gets pretty busy on 264. Criminal investigator Salvantis Begay is one of nearly a dozen officers who patrol Route 264. He's about to head back to town when Officer Marwin Joe comes on the radio. The gay races to join Officer Joe in the middle of a high-speed pursuit of a drunk driver. Once they stopped, they took off on foot. The subject left out of the vehicle running black hat and a black shirt on the west side of the hill. Okay, 
Down here. More officers arrive to help track down the suspect. One of them is Chris Holgate. I was just on a previous traffic stop when I heard the call going out, the vehicle not stopping. And we got there as fast as we can to back him up. Once we arrived there, everybody else was on the rocks looking, and they started looking in the north direction. Me and another officer, we started looking in the southern direction to make sure he didn't try to go one way and then backtrack himself. Holgate keeps his weapon drawn while he searches the area. If someone takes off from an officer, there has to be a reason why he could have committed a crime somewhere or he could have a warrant for his arrest. We just don't know, so we have to be extra cautious. As Holgate and Joe pick their way through the rocks, Begay and the officers on the hill spot the suspect on the run in the open country below. We start running towards the west from where they said we see him in our open areas. Once we went over the hill, you could just see him from a distance. And uh, he kept looking back as me and Officer Joe kept running after him full sprint as hard as we could. The suspect runs across the field and toward a road. Five, two, five, three, go, go. But a patrol car arrives, blocking any escape. Come on, hands up, hands up. Got him. And the man is apprehended. Mosquitoes too much. Huh? Yeah. Well, You're running away from the mosquitoes. Yeah. <laughs> See that black cloud on top yeah. of us? Yeah. <laughs> the mosquito cloud is just right behind us. They're trying to catch up with him. The suspect is arrested for driving while intoxicated and unlawful flight. Okay. Anytime that someone tries to run from us, we assume that they've done something or have committed some kind of a crime. It feels good knowing that we put someone behind bars, that we know we're doing our job. The holy people blessed me to put on this uniform and help me get out there and do my job and protect the people who need to protect it, help the people who need to be helped.